previously in the complete creation. In other words, the correct answer to the quiz is B. It smells like it came from Mars. Welcome back. Thank you for tenaciously continuing in this odyssey, a video encyclopedia of sorts on the creation evolution debate. We've been talking about various radiometric dating methods, looking at the principles behind the methods, and then looking at case studies to show that in spite of the claim of staunch old earth advocates, the radio dating methods simply do not work. And they know it. Over and over again, the deep time advocates have rejected radiometric ages whenever they contradicted their predetermined dates and times. Obviously, they would not do that if they really thought that radio dating methods were solid science. Now, would they? Many of these geologists, having the utmost of sincerity, will first claim that radio da radiometric dating methods give solid ages of the rocks, independent of evolutionary timescales. However, when the radiometric dating methods return ages that defy the evolutionary ages, which are literally based on nothing more than wishful thinking, those same geologists will then turn around and, with all sincerity, reject their own radiometric dates. Let's take an extensive look at a case study that unfolded over the early 70s using various dating methods on the sediments and lava rocks of an area in Africa from whence, whence came a very famous fossil skull, Homo rudolfensis or skull 1470. For this next section, we'll be following the path that Marvin Lubinow set out for us in his first edition of his book, Bones of Contention. His first appendix, entitled The Dating Game, was exceptionally well written, exhaustively documented, and I highly recommend reading it if you can get a copy of the book. The second revised edition of his book, for whatever reason, was missing this appendix, which is too bad because it was such an awesome chapter of the book. Skull 1470 was found by Richard Leakey in 1972, originally claimed and believed by Leakey to be 2.9 million years old. It was startlingly modern in appearance. Now, by that, I mean, remember that according to evolutionary theory, modern man evolved from an ape-like creature. And so during the descent of man, the skull shape changed over time from probably chimp-like to take on the skull shape that we have today. Not only was Skull 1470 startlingly modern in appearance, there was also tools found in those sedimentary layers. Now they are simple stone tools, but they demonstrated intelligent man as well. Now a significant point about radio, me radio dating methods that I had put aside for the moment was that radio dating methods cannot be applied to sedimentary rocks like the rocks Skull 1470 and the associated tools were found in. This is because the sedimentary rocks are made up of sediments, which are basically other older rocks that were pulverized or eroded. These sediments were all mixed together from who knows where and cemented together into new rock layers. So you simply cannot radiometrically date sedimentary rocks because you would get different ages from each individual grain of sand in the rock because they are all from different rocks. So you can only apply radio dating methods to original rocks like lava rocks or volcanic ash. In the early days of Leakey's research in that area, 
He had a geologist working with him at East Rudolph, a young lady by the name of Kay Berensmeyer. She located a layer of volcanic ash, or a tuff, in the middle of the formation. This spot was named the K. Berensmeyer site, and this volcanic tuff subsequently became known as the KBS Tuff. And that tuff would become the lightning rod for what's about to come down the pipes here. That tuff gave the paleontologists opportunity to obtain radiometric dates for the fossils found in the sedimentary layers immediately above and below the tuff. This KBS tuff was first radiometrically dated using potassium argon in 1969, several years before the skull 1470 was discovered. This little fact is about to launch us into a bizarre merry-go-round that is sure to make you plenty dizzy from the circular reasoning. Because the rocks were dated before the discovery of a significant fossil find, we can now go back and retroactively test a variety of dating methods. Fitch and Miller published their radio dating results in the peer-reviewed science journal Nature in 1970. The first batch of rock samples were run through potassium argon dating method and returned ages of somewhere between 212 to 230 million years old. Fitch and Miller then wrote from these results, it was clear that an extraneous argon age discrepancy was present. Translation, these ages are clearly wrong. Uh, question, how do we know those ages are wrong? Lubinow explains it best, so I'll just quote from his book. Dates of 212 to 230 million years ago were notoriously far off. These dates would place the KBS tough in the Triassic period of the Mesozoic area, which is early dinosaur times. Hence, it was obvious that these dates were wrong. Without the associated fossils, however, there would be no way for a geologist to know if these were good dates or bad dates. So Fitch and Miller obtained more samples from Leakey and ran them through a battery of potassium argon radio dating tests. For the LB1 sample, it was dated at between 2.25 and 4.62 million years old. Please notice that the maximum age is literally more than double the minimum age. But they conclude that 2.5 million years old is a close minimum age. Question of the rhetorical kind. Uh, how do they know that's the close minimum age? For the LB2 crystals, they got 2.37 million years old as a minimum age and concluded that 2.64 million years old is a reasonably close age, an 11% difference. But they conclude that 2.61 million years old is a very close age estimate. Question of the rhetorical kind. How do they know that that is a very close age estimate? because as they explain in their next sentence, these age indications are all consistent. Look, I mean no disrespect, but when you're talking a range of ages that are within 200% of each other, only after rejecting all of the other age indications you had that had a range of 10,000%, then sure, I guess the age indications are all consistent. Are you starting to see how quickly this gets ridiculous? This isn't science. This is religion. It is sincere religion. I have no doubt about the sincerity of Fitch and Miller in trying to determine an accurate age, but they are force fitting the research results into their preconceived, predetermined, canonical religious views of deep time. This age of 2.61 million years would become the benchmark age of the KBS tuff for about a decade. Uh, in fact, later on, after Leakey discovered Skull 1470 beneath the KBS tuff, he would repeatedly refer to this 2.6 million year age as accurately dated. Then in 1972, not yet knowing of the discovery of Skull 1470, Vincent Maglio published a paper again in Nature magazine detailing his dates assigned to the various sedimentary layers around the KBS tuff. 
he based his ages primarily on the animal fossils scattered throughout the layers. Most importantly, he found some elephant fossils uh, throughout all the layers and a number of fossils of different species of pig. The pigs are about to become of critical importance because in Maglio's opinion, the changes mapped out a sequence of rapid evolutionary changes in the pigs over time. The dates Maglio assigned to the pig fossils were consistent with Fitch and Miller's date of 2.61 million years for the KBS Tuff. And at that time, Maglio's work was considered to independently verify that age. But now that's where we start spinning around in circular argumentation. If you read Maglio's paper, he writes, The indicated age range includes the potassium argon date of 2.6 million years for the KBS Tuff located within the sedimentary unit containing this fauna. It must be pointed out that such correlation depends upon the accuracy and stability of the Fitch and Miller absolute chronology. So, Maglio's chronology agrees with Fitch and Miller's age, assigned to the KBS Tuff, but Maglio's chronology is actually dependent on Fitch and Miller's age assigned to the KBS Tuff. But if you go back to Fitch and Miller, they rejected their original dates of 212 to 230 million years old because of the fossils. In 1974, Brock and Isaac studied paleomagnetic signatures on the deposits below the KBS Tuff. So paleomagnetic signatures are just Earth's magnetic field turning a rock into a weak magnet as the rock is formed. So theoretically, you can measure the magnetic field stored in the rock layer and determine what the Earth's magnetic field was like when the rock was formed. Was the Earth's magnetic pole reversed? Was it fluctuating? You know, questions like that. The paleomagnetic dates would provide a valuable check on other dating methods. Brock and Isaac tested 247 samples and arrived at ages for the rocks underneath the KBS Tuff of 2.7 to 3 million years old, which paints Fitch and Miller's 2.61 million year age for the Tuff as an absolute bullseye. But wait! When you read Brock and Isaac's paper, you find that the starting point for the correlation is the age of 2.61 million years obtained by Fitch and Miller. While Brock and Isaac's work was viewed as independently verifying the Fitch and Miller age, Fitch and Miller's date was the foundation for the Brock and Isaac date. But it gets better and more dizzying. Read on in Brock and Isaac's paper where they claim that an independent chronology for the Kubi Fora formation has been presented by Maglio on the basis of mammal fossil zones. Wait, as we already saw, Maglio's work was not independent from Fitch and Miller, but rather he used Fitch and Miller's date as the starting point of his research. Brock and Isaac close out their paper by citing further unpublished radio dating of the Kubi Fora formation by Fitch and Miller. Because the paleomagnetic and radiometric dates were so close, they concluded that this independent evidence greatly strengthens our proposed chronology. Wait, 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 just wait a minute here. Brock and Isaac just said that the unpublished radio dates independently confirm their paleomagnetic dates. Because in September of that same year, Fitch and Miller teamed up with some others and published that research. Get a load of how they start off that paper. Dating of the other tough horizons was, however, more difficult. That's some scientific code words going on right there. Whenever you see anything like this written in a scientific paper, read between the lines. They just admitted that they performed a test to ascertain something's age, got back an age that they would not accept, and they rejected those ages. They said it right there in print. We performed dating of the other tough horizons. However, 
Translation? We did not get the dates we were looking for. Scientists are under no obligation to publish any research results. If they get a date that doesn't line up with what they are expecting, they will toss it in the garbage and make no mention of it. Here, they are at least tacitly admitting that they ran tests which returned ages that they rejected. So, are radio dating methods accurate or not? You cannot tell me that radio dating methods generate absolute ages when you can pick and choose which ages you keep and which ones you reject. But I digress. Fitchadal's research is very important in this story. They conducted radio dating on over 100 rock and mineral samples, and here come some of those bad dates they hinted at. They got ages returned from the Karari Tuff of between 600,000 and 1.39 million years. Notice the highest possible age is more than double the lowest possible age. They conclude the dates are bad because there was both argon loss and excess argon in the samples. Question, how do they know there was a gain or loss of argon? But get this, in the closing remarks of their paper, they reference Brock and Isaac's paper on the paleomagnetic dating. The compatibility of independent evidence is a very strong argument for accepting the chronology now proposed for East Rudolph. So, walk with me here. In 1970, Fitch and Miller conduct radio dating on the KBS Tuff to arrive at an absolute age of 2.61 million years. This is only after they absolutely reject other absolute dates, which did not line up with the dates of the fossils in the rocks. This 2.61 million year age was confirmed by Maglio's dates of the fossils, but of course, Maglio built the ages of the fossils using Fitch and Miller's 1970 date as the foundation. Then, in 1974, Fitch et al. performed radio dating on over 100 samples, explain away and ultimately reject any of the absolute ages that don't confirm their 1970 date of 2.61 million years for the KBS Tuff. Thus, they confirm their original date. After all, their 1974 date dramatically aligns with the paleomagnetic date arrived at by Brock and Isaac. Of course... Brock and Isaac arrived at their date after building their chronology on Fitch and Miller's original 1970 date. And it was further confirmed by Boglio's date, which was confirmed by the ages of the fossils around the KBS Tuff. Of course, Boglio's dating scheme was built upon Fitch and Miller's 1970 date, so this confirms Brock and Isaac's date. And as incredible as it is to say, Brock and Isaac's paleomagnetic date was in stunning agreement with Fitch et al's 1974 date. But of course, Brock and Isaac's date built upon Fitch and Miller's original 1970 benchmark date. Fitch and Miller et al, Maglio, Brock and Isaac, keep using that word independent when referring to their dating methods. In the words of Inigo Montoya, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. So, Anthony Herford, also in 1974, published his research with fission track dating of the 3.9 tough. With fission track dating, they look at the radiation damage within the rock fission tracks. They can tell what isotope it is by how far the tracks go, and by counting the number of tracks, you can estimate the age of the rock since it's solidified, as a liquid won't preserve these tracks, only a solid rock will. So, this is now a fourth method of dating being used. He wrote, Comparison of these results revealed the specimen has either suffer suffered no thermal annealing, or that it has been totally annealed, at 1.8 million years ago. What he's saying here is if the rock was heated or annealed, it can destroy the fission tracks. Heating of the rock can completely mess up other dating methods as well, such as potassium argon, because the heating will basically bake the argon gas out of the rock and reset the radiometric clock. You'll see such reheating events called annealing or overprinting. 
So he brings up two conclusions from his research. Either the rock has never been reheated, or the rock was reheated 1.8 million years ago. Okay, weird flex, but let's run with it. How do we know which answer is the correct one? Well, as he explains, well, Fitch and Miller provided a solid date of 2.6 million years for the KBS tuff, which was above the tuff being dated. So, clearly, the 1.8 million year date is correct for the reheating event. Question, how on earth did this tuff get reheated 1.8 million years ago while all of these other tufts evidently did not get reheated as they are all showing ages older than 1.8 million years. So let's step back for a second to take a look at what all has gone on here. We've had like 10 different researchers involving four different dating methods based on hundreds of samples and measurements that all confirm the date of 2.6 million years for the KBS Tough, published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. I like how Lubinow put it. What better proof could one want for the reliability of the various dating methods to furnish independent confirmation of the dates for the fossil material? Because 1470 was found below rock dated at 2.61 million years ago, and above rock dated at 3.18 million years ago, Skull 1470 was estimated to be an incredible 2.9 million years old. Richard Leakey had found the world's oldest fossil belonging to the genus Homo. The problem was that Skull 1470 was too modern in appearance by evolutionary standards. Such a modern human should not have evolved yet. In his interview with National Geographic magazine, Leakey was not speaking hyperbole when he said, either we toss out this skull, or we toss out the theories of early man. Think of the textbooks! Think of the scientific journals! Everything would have to be rewritten! Leakey fought for this 2.9 million year old age, and with good reason. It would make his discovery the oldest fossil of Homo, modern man. But this was unacceptable to the evolutionary timeline. It was essentially an out-of-place fossil in the evolution comment column. Please note, I am ignoring the debate of what defines it as modern or primitive. As you can see by the darker portions of the reconstruction, uh, this is clay used to fill in missing pieces. The skull has been badly broken up, distorted, and pieces are missing. But let's all ig ignore all of that and ignore the debate that raged about the interpretation of the fossil. Let's just go with what the evolutionary researchers basically all agreed upon. This was a fossil skull that exhibited multiple features that were similar to modern man and not an ancient creature with more ape-like features. Do not underestimate the fame and fortune that come to the discoverer of the oldest fossil human ever found. A huge conflict arose between Leakey and the rest of the evolution community as a result. Leakey, understandably wanting to defend his acclaim for discovery of the oldest human fossil, and the rest of the evolutionary community which must reject such claim as it upends the entire evolutionary descent of man. So when ardent advocates of deep time point to a vast array of different dating methods all confirming each other, don't let that impress you because deep down they themselves are not impressed. We are about to witness the entire evolutionary community turn around at the drop of a hat and reject such vast array of different dating methods, all confirming each other, when something like Skull 1470 comes to light. Now, I'm running out of time for this segment, so I will close with a taste for what's coming next. Fitch and Miller teamed up again with Hooker in 1976 to revisit the radio dates on the KBS Tough. Why? They devoted a portion of their paper to that topic, which is incredibly revealing. Starting with the title of the section, 
opposition to our dating. Hold up. Are these radio dating methods accurate or not? Why on earth would any evolutionist oppose the dates determined by hundreds of radiometric dating tests? But look at their choice of words explaining this opposition. Over the past five years, opposition to the acceptance of a 2.5 million year age for the KBS Tough has come from three sources. First, archaeologists and paleoanthropologists disturbed by the consequent antiquity of hominid fossils and stone tools found close to or associated with the KBS Tough. So here we are, having dozens to hundreds of different samples of measurements, using multiple dating methods, giving us ages that confirm and corroborate each other. It is then the evolutionists and deep time advocates themselves who go on to reject their own dates. Obviously, they themselves do not honestly believe that radiometric dating methods are reliable and irrefutable. Being disturbed is an emotional reaction to the evidence, not a scientific one. In fact, the reaction is anti-science. But I'm out of time for this lecture. Please join me again for the next segment, where we follow through this sordid yet enlightening tale to the end. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. If any date from any dating method paleomagnetic, fission track dating, radiometric dating, isochrons, etc. disagrees with this evolution column and these predetermined dates, the dates are sacrificed at the altar of evolution. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.